Well, hey, good morning. morning. It is so good. Just as Jeff said, it is so good uh, to be together. It's good to to be worshiping together in the same room, uh, online, uh, in the sanctuary, wherever you are joining us from today. Uh, Very, very good to be here with you. And if you want to follow along uh, with the sermon, we have sermon notes. You can scan the QR code uh, using your phone, and you can uh, follow along with me uh, as we, we move through the text. And uh, good news as well, uh, with Jeff's announcement of being exposed uh, to COVID-19, his test came back negative. We got a text yesterday. Uh, I was on my way to Sonic, uh, you know, because that's what I do, and uh, got a big text from him. So him and Stacy are both doing well, uh, and he should be back back in the saddle shortly uh, as far as the the preaching and all that stuff goes. Uh, So good. It's success, right? Success uh, in our world is a negative uh, test, which is kind of strange when you think about it. Success is a negative thing, but it's true. We measure success in all sorts of different ways, uh, and each one is, is unique to us or unique to our family. This is the kind of family uh, that we want to be, the church. Uh, our church has different measures of success than, than maybe even some other churches. We all want to make disciples, but how we do that, what that looks like, is different. And, and so I don't know if you know this or not, but when you think of success, Uh, I like to think of success, I didn't really until I started the sermon, but we'll say this for now, I like to think of success, uh, as as going to the store and shopping for a banana. Now, when you think of a banana, you think of this, right? This is what you think of. And and, and when you go into a grocery store, you walk into the grocery store, you look around, if you want to buy an apple, you can buy all kinds of different apples, right? There's there's Fuji, there's, there's Red Delicious, there's Granny Smith's. All this other stuff. If you want to buy grapes, there's all different kinds of grapes. But when it comes to bananas, you're pretty much locked into this. This is your option. Uh, It's called a a Cavendish banana. And despite what your grocery store wants you to believe, it is not the only kind of banana out there. In fact, there are a thousand different kinds of bananas out there. What's unique about the Cavendish banana, though, is that despite what happens to you when you get home and you bruise your bananas uh, when you get home... Uh, they are fairly tough-skinned, which means they're good for transporting from countries that can actually produce bananas. Also, they taste pretty good, they're pretty delicious on the, the banana taste spectrum. And the really cool thing is they're seeds. Did you know bananas have seeds? Of course they do, they're a fruit. But they are so small that you eat them and you don't realize you're eating them. They're so tiny. Other bananas have fairly large seeds that we would have to pick out and, and figure out, why am I telling you all about bananas, this fun fact extravaganza that we're on here? I'm telling you about bananas because just like there are a thousand different kinds of bananas, we all have different kinds of success, different measures of what success is for us. Some of our success is, is being successful in our job, being successful at home, whatever. And for some of us, that changes week to week, month to month, year to year. Right now, I'm defining success as getting out of this year. You took Sean Connery from me, I'm done. Like, I'm out. It's just the last straw. Look, what I think God wants to tell you about today is that he wants to offer you a more simple success. He wants to offer you the Cavendish banana of success. We're in the, the, the series on Through the Spirit, and we're obviously talking about faithfulness. And when it comes to God and a relationship with him, being faithful is the measure of success for a follower of Christ. So what I want us to do is I want us to look at Luke chapter 16. Uh, Luke chapter 16, we're going to look at verses 10 through 13. And I want us to, to, I want to propose to you four arenas of faithfulness, four arenas of success, really, areas where we need to be stewards. And the first one is being faithful in little things. Let's be faithful in little things. Now, most of our well-being, most doctors, pastors, Uh, therapists, they will tell you, if you want to be successful in making changes in your life, what do you need to do? Little things. When uh, your dentist, if your dentist had to choose between you brushing your teeth every day or twice a day, or going and seeing him once a year or twice a year, the dentist is going to tell you, for the health of your teeth, just brush every day. If you've got to make a choice, just brush every day. If you want to have dietary changes, right, what do you do? You make healthy choices on a daily basis. You don't like stop eating for a couple days, and that's, no, that's not how that works. You don't swear off chocolate entirely. You, you manage it. You 
do things like that. Jesus points to the same things. Look at verse 10. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. It's important for us to define faithfulness for what it is. Faithfulness is not being necessarily full of faith. That's one way to look at it. That's not the context here. That's also not the context in the passage where we get the fruit of the Spirit from in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Faithfulness is trustworthiness. It's being dependable. It's being responsible. It's stewarding what you've been given well. And we can tell that from the text because he says, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest. Dishonest is the opposite of faithfulness. Dishonesty is not being trustworthy, right? It's not being reliable or dependable. So why does Jesus care that we are faithful in little things? Why does he want us to be faithful in little things? Well, the reason why is because God himself is faithful in little things. That's who God is. And if the fruit of the Spirit is something that comes from the Spirit, it's going to evidence his character, right? And so God wants us to be faithful in little things because he is faithful in little things. Take the atom, for example. Not Adam like Adam and Eve, but the atom. It's tiny. It's minuscule. Can't even see it on a microscope. You have to special equipment to see it. And the atom is made up of what in the middle? Protons and neutrons, right? Nucleus, protons and neutrons, good. You guys are a little bit better than 9 o'clock was. And what orbits the nucleus? Electrons, right? And the, the sharing of electrons, the transfer, makes things, uh, molecules and all this sorts of stuff. And basic unit of life, right? I'm not a scientist, so if I screwed that up, I'm sorry. But the bottom line is God, in his providence, I believe in a providential God. And what I mean by that is I believe in a God who works through natural means, as well as supernatural means, to hold this thing called the universe together. Keep it going. Keep it running. And so, yes, he's faithful in supernovas and black holes and stars being born. He's faithful when a baby is born. And he is faithful in holding together atoms. Because if he didn't, they would just melt away. And we would cease to exist. God is faithful in little things. And he wants us to be faithful in little things too. For two reasons. One, when we're faithful in little things, we show that he is faithful in little things. We tend to be, as a people by and large, very bottom line, very big picture, very ends justify the means kind of people. Right? Who are my non-detail oriented people here? This me. It's okay. It's okay. Well, like nobody's raising their hand. So I, I feel very isolated and alone right now. I need to call somebody and talk to them about that. No, I'm, I'm very much not a detail-oriented person. I'm big picture. I get lost in the details sometimes. But when we focus in on the seemingly insignificant things of life, the things that the rest of the world's like, that's not important, but when we key in on it, we show that God himself finds insignificant things important. Think about uh, when Jesus tells uh, the disciples, let the little kids come to me. Back in his day, kids didn't matter. They were insignificant. Well, don't distract the teacher with children. And Jesus is like, no, 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 let them come to me. Children are incredibly important in our day. And I think one of the reasons why is because we follow the teachings of Jesus historically. On the other uh, side of things, there's a woman who gives two copper coins, and Jesus notices her. Everybody else is giving out of their wealth, but she gives out of her poverty, and Jesus says, that was insignificant, but that's very important. When we take note of insignificant things, things that other people overlook, things that people think aren't value, we allow the body of Christ, when we allow Scripture, when we allow God to tell us what is important, we show ourselves to be interested in success as God defines it, being faithful in little things. So for you, what does this mean? It means don't just focus on being the perfect husband or the perfect wife. Don't focus on never, ever, ever doing that sin again. Be focused on being faithful in the next moment, the next opportunity. So how are you going to be a good spouse or a good employee or a good follower of Christ in the next instant? How are you going to resist temptation the next time? Yeah, you might give in a week from now, but hey, guess what? What's the next opportunity you have? When we get into the big picture, we become overwhelmed. Things seem impossible. And there's good news, because that's the other thing we need to know about God being faithful in little things. 
There's grace and mercy for that. You're not always going to be successful being faithful in little things. Not always. That's frustrating for some of us. My detail-oriented people are like, why can't I do that? There's grace for that. Jesus knows that we cannot keep track of all the little things in our lives, all the little bananas that we've got to keep track of, right? Do you know that uh, scientists speculate that there's 107 billion people who have ever lived on Earth? 107 billion. And did you know that Jesus died for you? Your mistakes, your shortcomings, your failings. One out of 107 billion. That is an insignificant number. But because of the great love with which he loved us, he dies. Because he knows we can't handle the big things. And we can't handle the little things really either. It's too much. And so his grace is there for us. So we need to be faithful in little things. We also need to be faithful in things that are valuable. We need to be faithful in the valuable things. What is uh, something that you value the most? If you're a homeowner, it's probably your house, right? Monetarily, it's the thing that probably is the worth the most in your life. If you don't own a home, it's probably your car or something like that. But we attach monetary value, sorry, we attach value to things outside of monetary value, right? For instance, I have an entire drawer fill at my, full at my home of my little girl's drawings. Now, they, unless one of them grows up to be the next Vincent Van Gogh, like, they will never, ever be worth anything. But they mean the world to me. They are valuable to me. I define value differently when it comes to them. Speaking of children, could there be a greater monetary drain on your life than children? I think it's, what, $500,000 to raise a child to adulthood is like the average? Goodness. But yet, we have them. And we love them, and they bring joy. They bring other value to our life. We love kids. They're beautiful. Friendship. Think about your best friend, the best friends that you have. Are they the ones that, like, make the most money for you? No. In fact, they're probably the ones that have nothing to do with your bank account. That's how you can trust them. Nothing to do with it. Jesus points out to the same thing in verse 11. Look what he says. If then you have, who have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? This unrighteous wealth here doesn't mean like ill-gotten gain, like somebody went to Vegas and, and cashed in big. What they mean is, what Jesus is talking about here is secular wealth. Wealth is just gained by, by working. By The Bible is very neutral on money. The Bible doesn't think money is good or bad. The Bible cares about what you do with Money And Jesus makes an interesting assertion here. He says in verse 11, If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? I think we tend to think of money as, as some kind of uh, money is valuable and then other things are valuable. What if there's like a sliding scale of value? And money winds up on the lower end of the scale. I think Jesus is saying here, Money is one of the least valuable things that you have. It's not, un, it's, not, it's not worthless. It's just not the most valuable thing that you own. It's not the most valuable thing you own. What if so many of us measure our success, our banana that we measure our success by? The banana that we're chasing after is money. It's those little presidents with you know, numbers on them. It's the numbers on a screen that define our worth. But everybody in this room, everybody watching online, everybody watching in the sanctuary, if there was a fire, you would rescue your friends, your family, your pets, your, your memories, you'd rescue experiences, you'd rescue uh, wisdom gained from this proverbial fire. You would rescue all that before you ever got to money. So why don't we live that way? Why don't we choose to live that way? It's because when it comes to my everyday choices, I don't always think that money is the least valuable thing that I own. That fire that we're talking about isn't something that just pops up in your life one day. The fire's always going. And, and like somebody filling the engine on a steam engine, you're just throwing coal, you're throwing experience, you're throwing opportunities to be with your family, opportunities to glorify God. We throw that into the fire in an effort to make more money, to, to grow our portfolio, to grow in wealth. 
And Jesus is saying here that there are, there are things more important, there's things more valuable than money. And I think most of us agree with that intellectually, but in our heart, in our everyday actions, we maybe don't as much. You have opportunities every single day to choose what is more valuable over what is financially valuable. And I think one of the ways you have to do that is by letting go of some of that financial value. You have an opportunity today. Jeff talked about it. You have an opportunity to give. Now, I'm not taking this opportunity to make you feel guilty about giving. In fact, if you do feel guilty, don't give. It's not what I'm talking about here. But I think that God is encouraging us, wants us to let go of some of our financial wealth so that he can lay in our hands some of those things that are more valuable, so that we can see that they are more valuable. And I'm not talking about like a health and wealth, prosperity gospel type thing here. I'm talking about the opportunity that we cling to money so much that we have to let it go as our measure of security, as our measure of success. Got to let go of some of it so that God can put his measure of success in your life. Something new that's not based on something so temporal and really so least valuable as money. But you have an opportunity to give. You should take that opportunity as God leads, of course. As God leads. Now, we need to be faithful in valuable things. We need to be faithful in little things. But we also need to be faithful in the things that belong to another, to another person's things. So one of the things that we do to find out if something is our area of responsibility, right? We, we ask about it. Uh, I do this at work. Like, if it's not clear to me in a meeting whether or not I'm supposed to, like, have a take-home project, I'll ask, like, is this mine or is this somebody else's? But we do this in a lot of stuff, right? So for those of you that cut your grass... When you're cutting your grass, do you just like keep going? You're just mowing. You're like, I'm going to go to my neighbor's yard. In the yard after that? No, you stop. Where do you stop? The property line, right? Now, if your neighbor asked you to mow the grass, sure, you would. But you don't just randomly like start mowing other people's lawns. That's weird. I clean my own house. I don't break into other people's homes and clean their house. I don't go into anybody's home anymore anyway. That would be weird. You might appreciate it. The cleaning criminal strikes again. You know. When it comes to parenting, if I'm hanging out with my kids or hanging out with your kids and all of a sudden I just start like disciplining your kid, that's super not okay, right? We have this uh, thing that we like to say, and I actually think it should be the new American slogan rather than like e pluribus unum. It should be mind your own business. <laughs> like, that, that's actually like our national motto. It's mind your own business. I'm, let me do my thing, right? When I was in the army, I was told that I needed to take care of my career because nobody was going to take care of it for me. But Jesus seems to say something else entirely. Look at verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Jesus is making an assumption here. There will be things that come into your life that you're responsible for that don't belong to you. They belong to somebody else else. You'll be entrusted with someone else's stuff. Part of Christianity, part of being a follower of Jesus means that you are a part of a communal faith. One of the the negative things that I think happened uh, with American Christianity is we wedded our love of like rugged individualism with uh, our faith. And so even though like personal relationship with Jesus, very important and a key component of what we do as Christians, we've emphasize that and really let the communal nature of our faith go by the wayside. We think it can just be me and Jesus. And that's so not biblical. It's not what the scriptures teach at all. Jesus assumes that you will be in community. And I think one of the reasons why this entrusting other people with our stuff and their stuff entrusted to me is a part of our faith is because it's what we are asked to do when it comes to our relationship with Christ. Jesus wants you to entrust him with your stuff. And not just your money, not just your material things, not even the people in your life necessarily. He wants your very soul. He wants you to entrust him with the core of your being. The reason why the Son of God came to earth, the reason why Jesus Christ died for you, one of 107 billion people, is so that he could prove that he is faithful and that his faithfulness will have an impact and an effect on your life. He died so that you could trust him and that that trusting him would make a difference. 
Jesus died to give you a relationship with God. And when you put your faith in him, not in yourself, not in your own measure of success, not in being the best version of yourself, that you, not, not any of that. God doesn't want successful you. He just wants you. God doesn't want cleaned up you. He just wants you. So don't worry about getting cleaned up before you come to Christ. Put your faith in him now and your trust in him now. And what happens is he shows that he's worthy of our trust in dying for us. So the word faithful, right? Again, we, we, we tend to think it means like full of faith, like full of trust. I don't think that's what it means here, obviously. I've said that. But I, I think when we think of God being faithful, God is not full of faith. That makes sense. I don't, I don't think God has faith. He doesn't have to. What it means to be full of faith is actually to have other people's faith in you and you don't disappoint. So other people have put their faith, their trust, their, their idea of responsibility in you and they expect you to come through for them and you don't let them down. That's what it means to be faithful. You're not full of your own faith. You're full of the faith of other people. So when we say that God is faithful, he's full of our faith and he doesn't let us down. He doesn't disappoint us. So Let's let this think about you. What other people, who else in your life has put their faith in you? Who are you supposed to be full of faith? Who has given you their faith to be full of? Your job? We're working from home. A lot of us are still working from home right now. Are we faithful to not steal time? Or does Netflix tend to acquire a little bit of our interest? Are we stealing from our company? Room this size, audience watching online? Reason to think that somebody could be embezzling. Are you being faithful with the resources and money that your work is giving you? What about your kids? Are you being faithful with what they've entrusted you? Contrary to what they may want you to think, particularly teenagers, they are trusting you to show them how to be a human being. Now, a teenager would never let you know that. But they are still watching you. They have entrusted you. Show me how I'm supposed to live. What about your spouse? Your spouse has entrusted you their very heart. Who they are. Are you faithful to that commitment? Are you faithful to that promise you made? I don't think it's any surprise that Jesus here in verse 18, after we, we skip down from this, actually starts talking about marriage. He says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Now, we don't like to talk about divorce. But I think everybody would agree 99.9% .9 of divorces happen because somebody or both parties stopped being faithful with what was entrusted to them. And I'm not talking about adultery necessarily. I'm talking about somebody forgot you were entrusted with the heart of another person. Being entrusted with another person's thing is core to being a follower of Jesus Christ. And we have to take that seriously. That is a measurement of success. Is being faithful with what other people give us. Being faithful in valuable things and being faithful in little things. And frankly, if you were sitting here listening and thinking, wow, Travis, I thought you were supposed to give me something simple. That sounds like a whole lot more bananas I need to worry about. That is bananas, Travis. I'm really sad I didn't work that pun into the last one. God is calling you to be faithful to one thing. He wants you to be faithful to one thing. All of this stuff can get really out of control. When you think about all the little things, all the valuable things, the ability and the inability that we have to figure out what actually is valuable and what's not, and then all the other things that people entrust us with, my goodness, it's a lot to be faithful with, a lot to be trustworthy with. But Jesus says in verse 13, he tells us, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. I know he's saying money there. That money can be anything. You cannot serve God and success. You cannot serve God and climbing the ladder. You cannot serve God and being the perfect husband or the perfect father, or the perfect, perfect wife or mother or whatever it is. The perfect single adult, the perfect person, that, that whatever. You can't serve both those things. Here's why. Because when they intersect, one of those things is going to win out. And if you want to know what it is that you serve, how do you measure success? If you can lay your head down at night and sleep well because you're good at this, 
That's what you measure success by, and that's what you serve. That's your banana that you're chasing after. And it's tough, and it's difficult, and it may not be the best thing for you, but it's the only way you've ever figured out how to measure success in your life. And Jesus comes to you with his life, and he says, look, I want to give you something easier. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? He wants to give you a metric of success, and it's just being faithful to him. You can trust him with your life. You can trust him with what you have, and you can stick by that. And it's not doing it on a big grand scale and being like, I'm going to trust you with my life, Jesus. I mean, that's great, and we should do that. You should make that declaration. It's what baptism is. But at the same time, how about I'm going to trust you with the next, like, moments of my life. What do you got going on this afternoon? You going to hang out with friends? You going to hang out with family? Be present. Put your phone away. That's something I struggle with. Put your phone away. Be interested in them. Ask them questions about their life. Don't focus on explaining yourself. It's the first day of the month. Here we have arrived at November. Maybe you're supposed to have that budget conversation with your spouse. Don't argue about it. Be faithful in that conversation. What do you got this afternoon, this evening? You got TV? Got some alone time? Maybe carve out a little bit of space for God to speak in your life. 10, 15 minutes. I'm reading through 1 Thessalonians right now. Read through it with me. We'll read it together. And just be with the Lord. Think about, hey, we've talked about giving. Think about how you might be able to give. Call a friend or a family member that you haven't spoken with in a while. Be faithful to that. What do you got tomorrow? You probably got work. It's Monday. Yay. You got work. Be faithful with your work. Don't worry about the bottom line so much. Don't worry about being productive as much, although that's good. Worry about who are the people that you work with. How can I show them the glory and the love of God? How can I be faithful to him at work in the little things? What's truly valuable at my job? What other things have people given me to be responsible for? Jesus Christ wants you to be successful. He wants you to be successful. He wants the life that he's given you to matter and be significant to him. And the only way that happens is by accepting his definition of faithfulness, his definition of success. Anything else, it's going to be very frustrating. You're going to spend your whole life trying to navigate something that's really difficult when you can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you've already done that, start measuring your moments by have I been faithful to Christ in this moment? Have I been faithful to Christ in this hour, this day, this time? That's success. That's the banana worth chasing. That's the one, the Cavendish banana. That's success. So be faithful in the little things, absolutely. Take stock of those things. Trust the Holy Spirit to guide you in what those little things are. Be faithful in the valuable things. Maybe you need to re take a, a, a reevaluation of what's important. Maybe you've gotten off track. And then be faithful with what other people give you. Be aware of the trusts that have been placed in your life. And be faithful to the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you, despite the fact that we are unsuccessful in things that are so important and significant, being faithful to you, Lord, we drop the ball all the time. We chased after every other single kind of banana possible measure of success that there is. And Lord, you want us to just sit down with you and be faithful to you. And so God, I pray, thank you for your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy. And I pray that, that everybody in this room, everybody online, Lord, everybody in the sanctuary, I pray that we would, you would give us new eyes to see where we've measured success in a wrong way. And so Lord, I ask that by your grace, by your mercy, we would figure that out. I pray that we would draw strength from you and wisdom from you, and I pray that you would guide us in that. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I can't think of really a better way to do, to talk about God's faithfulness in a real way than to take the Lord's Supper uh, together. You have underneath your chair a, uh, a cup. Uh, if you're online, you've hopefully gathered uh, with us. I'm actually short one, if I can get one from somebody. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what this means, what this little 
cracker and juice means for us is that it's an opportunity for us to remember. We, uh, in the Baptist tradition, take this as an opportunity to remember, to reflect. It's a memorial for us. It's not, it's not just that, but that's the significant emphasis for us. And Jesus Christ came to earth. He lived for 30 plus years. He had 30 odd years to think about what it was he was going to have to do at the end of his life. And the night before, he was going to have to go through the most brutal execution ever. Not just physically brutal, but spiritually, emotionally brutal. He gathered with his friends. And he took time in a little thing to add significance, to add uh, meaning to something that is just really bread and drink. But he takes it, and, and if you're, you're here with us, you might have a, a one that has differently layered. You can take it. Make sure it's, you peel the right thing off here. It's, get the bread out there. And he, and he takes the bread, and, and he breaks it. And he says, this is my body that's given for you. When you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. And then he takes the cup and he tells them that this is his blood, which, which is, must have been so jarring for them. A group of men who, to drink another person's blood was just so incredibly foreign and it was not, it was, it, was, it was anathema in their faith as Jewish men. And this blood was the blood that Jesus was going to shed on the very next day on the cross. He was going to sweat droplets of it in the Garden of Gethsemane that very night. But it was important because what it was going to do was it was going to strike a new agreement between humanity and God. It wasn't going to be based on always doing the right thing. No, no, the new agreement was no matter what you do, no matter how successful you are in life, you can always come home to the Lord because Jesus Christ has made it a safe place for you. No longer are we enemies. And so he took that cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is the new covenant, which is in my blood. And every time you do this, you remember me. Lord Jesus, thank you for being faithful in the little things, in giving value to things that are insignificant. Just bread, just drink. But, it, Lord, it reminds me that I am important to you, that I have meaning because you gave meaning to something insignificant. And, Lord, as we go from this place and we have the taste of a, of a stale cracker and the taste of grape juice on our lips, we join with the thousands of years of human history that have had the same taste on their lips. that our Jesus loved us enough to go through great pain, to draw us close to him, to draw us close to his father, to make us a part of his family. Thank you. That's in your great name we pray.